morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here at the board of We just don't do vacation like well as many others are. So we are glad that you are here. If you're watching online. Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to KCC this morning. I've got just a few announcements this morning, uh, so I'll keep it hopefully pretty short. Ladies. If you've signed up for the Women's Bible Study, the Seamless Bible Study, that is starting tomorrow night right here. Uh, so make sure you get up. There's a lot of ladies that have signed up. If you have not signed up for it already, it's going to be amazing. Uh, summer Study, join that. Hey, we've been talking about this a lot, of, about our own personal growth, uh, our spiritual growth, and not just on Sunday mornings. We're doing it with other women and other men. And so, ladies, that starts tomorrow, all summer long. Men, if you have not checked out uh, the Men's Bible Studies every other week on Saturday mornings at 7 o'clock right here at church. So this coming Saturday, uh, we will be meeting again right here at Keystone. We're going through the book of Ephesians. And so check out the, the summer Bible studies. Join those. Uh, get to know some other people and uh, keep growing in your faith. Uh, then also... Three weeks from yesterday, we have our 4th of July cantata uh, on Saturday night, 6 o'clock. Bring your apple pie. Um, bring that out and uh, bring friends, invite friends. It is going to be an amazing night of experience uh, that you don't want to miss. If you've never enjoyed our cantata, it's a great night uh, of singing and fellowship together and eating together and just uh, and just a wonderful time to uh, thank the Lord for all he's blessed us with as a country and stuff like that. And so please make sure you check that out June 29th, three weeks from yesterday at 6 o'clock. Um, and it's called In the Name of Freedom. And so uh, connect uh, in with that. Uh, also, if you are new here, um, if you're new today or in the last couple of weeks, uh, fill out one of those connect cards on the seat back in front of you. Put it in the offering at the end of the service. It's just a way for us to connect with you. Say thank you for coming. We've got a welcome bag out there that we would love to give you uh, and just want to uh, appreciate that you are here with us this morning. Uh, we know that uh, there are many great churches, there's many opportunities to be able to go to them, but we are glad that you're here with us. Um, then also, um, we have a special guest this morning. That was my announcement. It's pretty quick, right? Yeah. Bible studies and cantata. And that was it. So uh, we have a special guest with us this morning. We have, uh, a lot of you know, we have five different ministries that we support um, as a church, that we tie to, that we give to, and that we support. And so one of them uh, is here this morning, uh, Thomas Stallings. Come on up, Thomas, uh, from Cornerstone. Let's give Thomas a, a lot of applause. And uh, Thomas is going to be sharing about what is going, what happened in their ministry this past school year, and how our support has been helping with that. And so, uh, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A lot of you guys at, at this point we're kind of family. You guys have seen me do this uh, since I was single, um, and before I had a beard. So, uh, you guys are so welcoming. Thank you so much for everything that you do to support the ministry. Uh, I have a couple of my friends, just to honor them, uh, Matthew and Jordan. Uh, they are from USF. Um, they're part of our church. They're an incredible example. Both of them are part of a small group that I lead called a covenant group. And as a church, we actually have 66 students involved in these weekly discipleship groups. And so we're, we're building the net to uh, cast it out and catch a bigger catch. So we're looking forward to that uh, coming up this fall. So a recap of this last academic year, that's how we live our lives, is, uh, fall, spring, and summer. So in the last academic year, since you guys saw me last, we had the opportunity to lead 200 students to the Lord. To <laughs> you guys, anybody remember when I had the little slideshow and it was all the giant list of names that just kind of kept going? Yeah. So this is more than that, you know? So it's just incredible. Um, you know, our, our goal has always been, uh, you know, in Acts chapter 2, it says day by day, they were adding to their number those that are being saved. So our goal has always been, let's see one person get saved for every day of the school year. And then someday that's, that number is going to be 365, amen? amen. Um, we got to baptize 79 students in the last academic year. We have 96, on average, 96 evangelistic Bible studies meeting every single week at USF. But we also have 34 discipleship Bible studies. So these would be people that are already members of the church, but they're learning how to go deeper in their faith, maybe even learning how to share their faith. 
which adds up to a total of 130 Bible studies, meeting every single week for the last entire academic year at USF. So we're, again, we're very happy to be part of one of the most productive, fruitful uh, ministries to reach college students in Tampa Bay, and you guys, by extension, get to be a part of that. So thank you very much. Pastor Joe? Thomas and their ministry. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and stand on up. Uh, bow your heads. We're going to pray for them and their ministry, not just for the summertime that they uh, hopefully will reach uh, their expectations for uh, financial support, but then also obviously the coming school year that will uh, their impact will continue to grow on the USF uh, campus, uh, just like our prayers, uh, our impact continues to grow in Pasco and Hillsborough County. So uh, let's take a moment just to pray for them and then pray for our service. So uh, Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you. God, thank you for uh, Thomas's heart, his wife's heart, God, their heart for serving you uh, on this campus, Lord. Uh, God, sometimes it can be the hardest generation, the hardest time period to reach students, um, Lord, but you have a way in every single person's heart, Lord. God, that you call us to you and that your Holy Spirit never stops working. Even when we sleep, you are always at work. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray for their impact, that it would be uh, impact generation for generation and generation to come. Uh, Lord, we pray that you continue to give him a, a fervent passion uh, for his ministry, God, and what you call him to. That, uh, a zeal that would continue to grow in their family and uh, the impact they're making with these students. Uh, God, we just pray for, um, Lord, their family as it continues to grow with little ones. Uh, Lord, that you bless them as father and mother, uh, not just husband and wife. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we can partner with them uh, to see your kingdom grow all over this state, God, and all over this country and this world, Lord. Uh, the impact that you are having everywhere. So Lord, we sing praises to you this morning, and we are so blessed and thankful, God, for all that you have done, and Lord, all that you are doing, and all that you're going to do beyond our comprehension, Lord, of how much it is. And so, Lord, we, we trust in all these things in you, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. amen. Well, let's take a minute as we start uh, to turn and greet each other and enjoy the morning together as we get started.
read from Joshua 24 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Yes.
singing along with the saints and the elders in glorious song and the praises they sing that are sing together. That I'll stay in forever singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God Almighty, over all. You were, you are.
I was like, you can play with his hands, play with his legs, but you are not tackling a newborn child. <laughs> After six years and Silas is older, Silas is like the size of Asher, my middle child. They're virtually the same size. They forget how small a newborn baby is. It's tiny. We've got a couple here sitting with us. They're, they're not big. And sometimes as parents, you forget. You forget things of the past. You just live in that presence. When I was growing up, when I was, by the time I was 21 years old, true story, by the time I was 21 years old, you talk about laws and, and obeying laws, we learn it as we grow up. But by the time I was 21 years old, I had seven tickets and 15 warnings from police officers. Right? And here's the thing that I would say, and I would say this is even true. I'm 44 now. I would say this is even true now hopefully more experienced and, and wiser, it was not that I was a bad driver. No, hear me out. It wasn't that I was a bad driver. But when you're young, you think some laws are just, eh, if I want to, if I don't. It wasn't that a bad driver. I wasn't getting in car accidents. It wasn't even close to car accidents. It, it, wasn't that, uh, it wasn't that I was out of control. It's just when you're young, sometimes you look at some laws and be like, Lord, these are optional, right? Sometimes I tell my boys what they should do and what they should not do. And they look at it and be like, hmm, did God really mean that? <laughs> Sometimes we look at that in the same way with Scripture. Did God really mean this? Like, God, this could be optional, can it? And today we're going to be talking about why some of these are, are not optional. Like, we're going to be talking about the different laws in the Old Testament. The ones that God, uh, through Jesus Christ, fulfilled. The ones that we should still be obeying for today. And why? And why he gave them even in the first place. And so, yes, God gave us laws that are transcendent for even today because they're about morality. They're about who God is. They're about right living. They're about expectations that God wants you to live a holy life. Now, notice what I just said there. Because some of us don't like this, but this is the truth. I said God wants you to live a holy life. I didn't say God wants you to live a happy life. Holiness comes first. Now, that's not saying God wants you to be miserable. Don't take that wrong. Nothing wrong with being happy. But if your goal in life is to be happy and not holy, you're missing the mark. The goal in life is to be holy. And that's why God gave the law so that we would understand it. His holiness. It's not about me, my pretend holiness that the world lives in today. It is about God's holiness and living to His standards, not God trying to conform to my standards. And so sometimes we hear the Ten Commandments and we think, oh, those are old. No, they are still all relevant for us today. They are still important because God does not change. God didn't grow after he gave the Ten Commandments and be like, hey, I gave you those, but I've learned more, so now I want to give you these. <laughs> no, God knew from before time began what he was giving us, and he knew they would be transcendent throughout all time, not just for 3,500 years ago. And so he gave these commands for us to learn, for us to grow, and for us to mature in holiness, not mature in happiness. And so as I got older, I began realizing as I drove more that I should obey the laws more. And so since I've been 21, Lord willing, I've only had one ticket. And I wouldn't just say it was my fault. But that's another story. So as we look at God's laws, there's three reasons for the laws in the Old Testament. Three reasons. First, they reveal God's character. This is important that we understand this. We're not even to that. I didn't put these in there. First, it's to reveal God's character. Second, they function as a restraint against sin. But then thirdly, they reveal to us what is pleasing to God. Three reasons why he gave us the laws in the Old Testament. Matthew 22, 34 through 40, uh, Jesus even says what are the greatest commandments. And he's, he's saying it even after De Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8, where he says, Jesus says all the laws of the prophets and the Ten Commandments, when he's asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
We have the Ten Commandments. What's the greatest? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And he's quoting there from Deuteronomy 6. And so Jesus is asked and he's given an answer. And we see even for today that when it comes to the Ten Commandments, if I love the Lord your God, the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I love my neighbor as myself, then I can't disobey any of the Ten Commandments. I mean, think about the Ten Commandments in themselves. Today, we're talking about having no image bearing that we would bow down to worship, just like Colin last week talked about not worshiping any false gods. Now, they have overlap, but they are different. We're going to talk about why they're different and why God gave the first one and then followed it up directly with the second one today. But it's important for us to understand that if we are obedient to what Jesus says, and the two greatest commandments, then we can't break the other ten. Because if I'm loving the Lord my God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, then I'm not going to worship false gods. I'm not going to worship images. I'm not going to do the things that the Ten Commandments tells me not to do that are still relevant for my life. And if I'm loving my neighbor as myself as we get into the later commandments, then I'm not going to bear false witness against my neighbor. I'm not going to covet what my neighbor has. I'm not going to lie, steal, and cheat because I love my neighbor. See, all of these things correlate with each other. The three different types of laws that were in the Old Testament, it's important for us to know this and understand this too. So this is going to be a little theological class for you this morning. Hope you don't mind. The first one was ceremonial laws. There's three different types of laws. The first one is ceremonial laws. They were specifically for Israel. They focus on the qualifications of priests, the requirements of how and when to perform sacrifices for sins, the cleanliness laws, the dietary laws, the festival laws, and the tithing laws. There were a lot of laws. They even made up 613 laws to make sure everybody followed the laws. Like they were determined we're going to follow these laws. Why? Is because when Israel entered the promised land, they didn't do what God said. And so they were broken up into two nations, Israel and Judah. They got taken into captivity. And when they went back to the promised land right before Jesus was born, they decided, man, we are going to be religious sticklers about every single law because we're not going to break them again. But they were missing the mark too. It was interesting in Scripture, in the Old Testament and New Testament, they didn't care enough about the laws, missed the mark. And then they became religious sticklers about the law and still missed the mark. And when Jesus came, he had to set them straight, straight about what God's intentions were for the law in the first place. We talked about this in past series, that the law was not given in the Old Testament for salvation. You can't find salvation in a law. The law was given so that people would understand right and wrong in God's holiness and his expectations for humanity. In the Old Testament, th their salvation came through knowing that God promised a Messiah to come and their hope was in that Messiah. Their hope was not in the law, but they had to have obedience to the law. And so the second law that we have is judicial, the civil laws specifically for Israel, just like the United States has different laws in some Mexico or Canada or other countries, these were very specific to Israel. And so they gave ceremonial laws and judicial laws, but then there is the third type of law that we're talking about all this series, which is the moral law. And the moral law is still for today. They're based on God's holy nature. That's what the Ten Commandments are. And they're designed for the world. They still apply for today because God does not change of what we just talked about a minute ago. These laws are holy and just, and they are unchanging. These laws encompass regulations on justice, respect, sexual conduct, and include the Ten Commandments. These moral laws do not point people to Christ. They merely illuminate the fallen state of all mankind. <coughs> Matthew 5, 17 through 18 says, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the laws of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. It's interesting here, the word fulfill 
means to bring to a designed goal, to fill up and complete, to bring to full expression for what Jesus did. Jesus was declaring that he fulfilled the prophecies. And even the patterns of scripture, he showed their true meaning. And so that all brings us to this morning, to the beginning of this series, as we look at the second law that we have here in Exodus 20, verse 4 through 6. So if you have your Bibles open there, it'll be on the screen as well, too, as we read through it. But verse 4 says this, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Now we're going to stop right there for a second, because this brings us into the first point. Just so you know, this command isn't meant... Some people have taken, the, taken it this way over the years, too. This command isn't meant to oppose artistic talent. You see a painting on the wall that's not sin. It was meant to stop people from making idols to worship. And what they had a problem with is what we're going to talk about with point number one. Good intentions sometimes can equal bad consequences. And we're going to talk about this why. Of why this law is here. In the Old Testament time, gods were carved out of oftentimes of either gold, silver, stone, wood, or some sort of metal. They were made so people could worship. This is all the Jews knew. Sometimes we have to walk back in the Jewish history, not for where we're at today, but understand this is all the Jews knew from their own history. The Egyptians, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Philistines, and all the other nations around them that ended up conquering, conquering them, they all had idols to worship their false gods. Something symbolic that represented their god. That's what it was. But you see, people often wanted some sort of figure to stand for the representation of God. But instead, they would often turn the figure itself into an idol and worship the idol and not God himself. You get what I'm saying here? I'll give you an example. King Saul in the Old Testament. God told the Israelites repeatedly, after they came into the promised land, God told the Israelites repeatedly, you do not need a king, you have me. And the people repeatedly went to God saying, no, we want a king. And so God relented and gave them a king, King Saul being the first king, right? After him was King David, King Solomon, if you know that, that lineage and that line. But King Saul was the first king. And what did the Israelites begin to do? It's exactly what God talked about and told them would happen. And exactly why we're talking about this this morning. The people ended up starting to turn to King Saul instead of King Jesus. Instead of God himself. And what happens is, is often we do things with good inten intentions, but there are bad consequences. And God warns us saying, look, you may have good intentions, but I know the outcome and it's going to be bad. You ever had like, something like that in your life before? This is what the scriptures tell us not to make an image to worship because our sinful nature distorts even good intentions and turns them into sin and God knows this. You know the Bible tells us to flee from idolatry. 1 Corinthians 10 14 says it. It says therefore my dear friends flee from idolatry. 1 John 5 21 says dear children keep yourselves from idols. It said it in the Old Testament. It said it in the New Testament because what God knew is humanity is sinful and fallen, and when we create something that represents God, we begin to worship that created thing and forget God. And that's how this is different than last week. Last week was don't worship false gods. Don't go down that direction. This week is don't make yourself an image for God. What did the uh, Israelites do? When Moses came off the mountain. What did they make? A golden calf. A golden calf. They wanted something. Think about this in biblical terms. Think about this in your own life. The Israelites wanted something to worship that they could see practically. And so they made a golden 
calf to worship. And what it turned out to be is they started worshiping the golden calf and they stopped worshiping God. And we do this with a lot of things in life. Our sin distorts things that are not supposed to be distorted and God warns us not to do it. Whatever created thing we make or has been made and we put it forth before God, this is idolatry. That God does not need you to bow down to something created to worship him. God wants you to bow directly before him. Mm -hmm. Nothing of this world. Because everything of this world is created. Everything of this world until he returns has been distorted and corrupted by sin. Including us. It's interesting, I have a quote here by Charles Spurgeon, a great theologian, says this way, If you love anything better than God, you are an idolater. If there is anything you would not give up for God, it is your idol. If there is anything that you seek with greater fervor than you seek the glory of God, that is your idol. And conversion means turning from every idol. That's why when we say, when we come to Jesus Christ, we are to repent and come to him. What does repent mean? It means I'm going to turn, not walk. It means I'm going to turn and run to the Lord. Because one of the things that I've discovered by knowing him as Lord and Savior is all of that is bad. And only he is good. And so when he gives us the Ten Commandments, that is my passion to know the Ten Commandments because they are moral laws, they are unchanging laws, and they continue to show me who he is. And by knowing who he is, I begin to develop that in myself through his Holy Spirit of saying, God, I want to be more like you. I don't want to be more like this world. That's just verse number one. Verse 5 says this. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, I'm about to say something with point number two. It may be the first time you've ever heard it like this, but I promise you this is biblical what I'm about to say. Because we don't often think of it this way. God's jealousy is life. Now, most of the time you think jealousy in a negative way connotation. But with God it is a holy connotation. Actually in Exodus 34 the Bible even says God's name is jealous. Because he has a holy righteous jealousy for you. Just like in marriage how marriage is described when a man looks at a wife or a wife looks at a husband in marriage you have a jealousy for them because of that holy covenant you have made. Because sometimes we just think of jealousy as such a negative thing. A jealous woman is considered a, a rival, a hostile, a bitter person filled with petty resentment. A jealous man is considered insecure, rude, and perhaps wildly competitive. But God tells us that he is a jealous God. And so if he is a jealous God, he is not a jealous God with sin. So what does that mean? The demand God is making is for single Minded worship of him alone. The image God gives here is the word jealous. It is a picture of a husband and wife. It is what you see that we as Christians are the body of Christ. And he is the groom. And that is our relationship to him. And he is jealous for you in every single way. He does not want you to stray. And so God's jealousy is holy. And his jealousy is life. His jealousy is to bring you into life with him. It's interesting, the Greek word for jealous is the word kana. It's Q-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. And what it means, it, it has two different parts to it. It's not just jealousy, it is also zealous. It is caring. Passionately. That is God's heart for mankind. He is jealous. He is zealous for you, his creation. He wants to be in right relationship with you. He wants you to turn your heart to him so that you will have a right relationship with him. What does that all add up to? That God is jealous to give you life. 
and life abundantly for eternity. And so God's jealousy is life to us. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul puts it this way, that even as Christians, we can have a godly jealousy. It's not just God that can do it, but a, there is a godly jealousy even as Christians. Paul writes, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. This is his heart for the church. When God says he wants all of you, that is him being a jealous God that he does not want to share you with this world. He wants all of you in every second and every moment. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to have that with him. And he wants you to live with him for eternity in heaven. And so as Christians, what Paul shows here is that we are to have that same kind of jealousy for mankind. Why does Jesus say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because he did the same for you. But why does he say the second one, love your neighbor as yourself? Is because we're supposed to have a godly jealousy for our neighbors that they will love Jesus too for all eternity. Don't be selfish in your love and saying, I'm only going to love God, but I'm not going to love my neighbor because that is wrong and that is sinful. We should be seeing 200 people come to Jesus all the time because we are living witnesses for a godly jealousy that other people will see life just as you have seen life in Christ. You see, God's jealousy is life, and that's what he calls us to. Human jealousy is selfish, but God's jealousy is righteous. And it is for all of us to be aligned with him. Because he is claiming his own. Kyle Eidemann is an author pastor today. He said this, God is jealous for your heart. Not because he is petty or insecure, but because he loves you. He wants all of you. Sometimes as Christians, we, we like to compartmentalize. We would say, this is me on Sunday mornings. Loving Jesus. <coughs> But this is who I am on Monday mornings, loving the world. God is a jealous God. He wants you loving him on Monday morning as much as you do on Sunday morning. There is no difference in his eyes. He loves you for eternity. You know, the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, those are the days that we've given names to. But God wants you every single day. He longs for you every single day. And so when he says, don't make an image, don't take the things of this world, whatever they may be, good intention or not, and begin bowing down to them. Now, sometimes we think of the practical idols that we see in the Old Testament of how they made the golden calf as a practical understanding of don't turn that into false worship. But sometimes we also have other things in this life that we turn into worship that should not be worship. Money, sex, sports. You can make a long list. Those are some of the top ones. You know your own life. Have we taken the things that have created in this world and placed them as idols before God? We all have to ask ourselves that question. The second half of verse 5 and verse 6, as we finish up this morning, it says this, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation hmm. of those who hate me. Verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, this is an interesting thing. Our third point and final point this morning is this. Our worship has ramifications for good and for bad. The Bible clearly shows it and how we do it and where it comes from. And we need to be clear on this. What is worship? It was interesting. I did, I did kind of a deeper dive into just the idea of worship. Like, what is worship? Because I think in the Christian world, I think there are many Christians who don't actually know what true worship is. I think some Christians think worship is just singing on Sunday mornings. I think other Christians think worship is I've given my 10% in tithe. Lord, I've now earned my way to heaven. 
See, over the last two, three hundred years of American civilization, I can guarantee you, because I've met them, <coughs> there are many people that think, why well, have my money? That's my, that's my worship. And it's a distorted worship. So I gave this definition of worship after searching and kind of pinning through and praying, but this would be my definition of worship. It's biblical worship as an act of exalting God in a place of honor and reverence because he is worthy. Worship is acknowledging the greatness of God both publicly and privately, whether public or private. Worship may include physical expression of praise, reverence, and humility. Worship admits that God deserves all our devotion and service because he is so far greater than anyone or anything else. And what you learn scripturally about worship is this. This is why these commandments are so important. This is why the second commandment is so important. Is that worship, get this, is both an attitude and an act. It is both. John 4, 23 through 24 tells us this. Jesus said, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Well, first off, worship is internal. We'll see it up on the screen. Worship is internal. Is a right heart, meaning I have salvation. I cannot worship God in the way that he demands. Not the way, just requires the way he demands if I am not right with him in my heart. Don't let anybody fool you. I'm going to say this, and this is very, very strong, but it is very true. Only a Christian who has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can worship God in the way that he deserves. Yeah. Period. Yeah. No one else on the face of the planet can. Because if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have been redeemed from your sins, then the question really comes down to is what are you actually worshiping? Are you worshiping yourself? Are you worshiping an idea? Or are you actually worshiping Jesus Christ? Because that's what worship is. I worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's one God and three persons. God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. That's who I worship. And if I don't know him, how can I follow his commands? Because I haven't followed the first thing he told me, which is to know him. And so we have to understand this. It begins with salvation. But also a right understanding. Notice what that passage said back in John 4, 23 and 24. I worship him in spirit and in truth. I need to have a right understanding. This is one of the dilemmas that we live in, the day and age that we live in, is everybody looks at this Bible and says, well, it's open for my interpretation. No, it is not. There is a right interpretation and there is a wrong interpretation. And let that be clear. There is. Now, there are some things in the Bible where I will tell people, that is a great question for God someday. I don't know. The Bible doesn't cover every single topic, but it does cover some topics. It's very clear. And it is not just open for interpretation because of the way that you feel or because of what society is telling you in the moment. I, t I, used to, I was a youth pastor for 20 years. I used to tell my junior high, high school kids, even when I was a college pastor, uh, I used to work with college students all the time, love them. I used to tell them all the time. If you move to wherever society is and say, well, I'm going to interpret the Bible based on society, just wait 50 years, it's going to change. What are you going to do then? What's interesting, we've seen in the last four years, I would say just wait three months and it's going to change. <laughs> so are we going to stand on God's truth, knowledge, or are we going to be persuaded by every little thing that comes to the world? You have a choice to make, and it's very clear. And so worship is internal. It's about a heart that has been saved by grace. It is about right understanding. A.W. Tozer put it this way. What comes into our minds this is a great quote. You probably have heard it before. You have it. It's a great quote. What comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. It is so vitally important of how we think about God. Our knowledge and understanding of God. And where do we get that from? Right here. Let that be clear. You get it right here. But it is also 
external. It is a posture. Kneeling, hands raised, bowed head. It is a gesture, gesture in service to others. And it is a truth, a spoken word evangelism. We worship externally and also we have it internally. We worship the Lord by being obedient. We worship the Lord by saying, you are Lord God. I will love you all with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we also worship by the Lord by remembering the second command that Jesus said. I will love. That's external. How am I going to show that love? I have to do something or say something. I will show that love externally to my neighbor, whoever that may be. And Jesus made it very clear. Everybody that you come across is your neighbor. Amen. It's just not the people that live next door to you. It's everybody that you come across. And so worship is internal, but it's also external. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies. You think it's external? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So internally, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. That's where it starts. Internally, I study his word that I may grow more in knowledge and in truth. And externally, I show everything that God is doing internally, externally to the world around me. I will worship him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those four things cover internal and external. And it is so important that it's just not one over the other. What worship is not, Matthew 15, 8 through 9. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You see, the Bible clearly shows us that if there is no heart dimension to our worship, you worship in vain. I cannot, so it begins internally in our heart. I cannot worship God externally if I do not know him internally. I have no desire to love my neighbors in the way God asked me to love my neighbors, where I will sacrificially sacrifice even myself, my own body, as we just read, if I do not know him internally in my heart. It starts with our heart. It starts not just with knowledge. Because here's the difference. Who knows that Jesus exists besides us? <coughs> Satan does. Satan's got the knowledge. Why do you think when Jesus was in the desert, Satan tempted him three times with things he knew were false from the Bible? And Jesus, what does Jesus do? He quotes three times from the Bible to deny everything Satan was trying to do. Satan knows God exists. It's not enough. To know God exists. It's not enough to say, I'm going to do good. It is enough when you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is not enough to bow down to things of this world and act like they're God when they're not. That's the whole point of the second commandment. Jesus clearly says that they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You see, you can do as many deeds as you want, go to as many church services as you want, and never be worshiping if it is all external and nothing is happening in your heart towards God. Do you get what I just said there? I'm going to say another thing. I'm here for saying some, hopefully some things that really hit you at the heart this morning. Because this is very... Uh, concerning that we need to be mindful of. Because some people I think today have done this. Some people worship worship instead of actually worshiping God. I'm going to say that one more time. There are some people in the world today that worship the idea of worship and not for what its true heart is meant to be, worshiping God. You see, all true worship belongs to God. Not the thought of worship, 
Not the thought of you coming on a Sunday morning and getting the chills and the feels when we sing of like, oh, I feel so much better. Because here's the thing. If your goal is to leave church feeling so much better, then you've missed the mark. The goal of church is not to feel, not to leave feeling better. The goal of church is to worship God as Lord and Savior no matter how you feel. And sometimes we worship the idea of worship that, man, if I don't leave church feeling better or feeling like I had a great worship moment, then you have missed the mark of what worship is, and your idol is worship to yourself and to your own feelings. I don't, I don't care how, I'll say this personally, I'll own this. I don't care how I feel going to church on Sunday mornings. Don't get me wrong. It's not the same we care less. Like, I hope I feel good. It's not like I want to feel bad. But whether I am feeling bad or whether I'm feeling great or anywhere in between, I'm going to church on Sunday mornings or I'm waking up Monday morning to worship God, not worship myself. And I'm doing it to worship Him because He's deserved of it. I'm not just going to worship worship because I think it makes me feel better. That goes through music, that goes through his word, that goes through prayer, that goes through fellowship time with each other, that we are to worship him in all circumstances, not just to worship worship. Because you can turn worship into a God because you're missing the mark of your heart being right before God, and it's all about you. And we are not called to do that. All true worship is, in essence, a matter of the heart. That's why I constantly say, even as a pastor, that if you have something that is going on in your heart, before you even worship, lay it down at God's throne and say, God, help my heart be right so I can worship you in the way that you deserve. And some of us go before God and say, God, I have this issue, and if you don't make it better, then we have an issue. And that is not right. God is not a genie in a bottle. So stop treating him like he is. And so God shows what we do in this life. And how we worship has ramifications for life. And he says the sins of our parents will have ramifications for generations to come. Just like a traitor can endanger a whole army, so too can an unrighteous parent leave a pile of trouble for the next generation to worship. Moses made it clear that children were not punished for the sins of their parents, but children would feel the ramifications of their parents' disobedience to God's laws for generations to come. The Lord does not punish the innocent, but if the children continue in the sins of the father, the Lord will punish them too. We are called to be living sacrifices. And I'm reminded of this as we close this morning. We are called to be living sacrifices for our families first. How can I show the world outside my home what Christ looks like if I can't do it with my own family? How can I show externally what it means to worship God if I have not worshipped Him internally with my heart first? It starts with Him and Him first. So do you worship for yourself or do you worship for God this morning? Are there false gods in your life? Are there things you made to celebrate God but now you celebrate them more than you celebrate God? That's what the second commandment is. Because make no mistake about it, this was and this still is a major issue in the world. These Ten Commandments still hold strong for today because these issues are still issues for today. They have not gotten better. In fact, with more people in the world, I would even consent that they may have gotten even worse. And so we are not to make false images to worship God. We are to go directly to Him to worship Him and His throne. That's what God requires. And that's why God wants your heart, your whole heart, not just part of it. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for this morning. God, may we worship you with our whole heart, Lord. 
May we not put anything in your place where you deserve God. May we worship you and only you, no matter how we feel. Lord, that is to give honor and praise and glory and recognition to you as Lord and Savior, the one true God. God, I pray our hearts will be right before you in all these circumstances, God. Lord, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Lord, well, thank you, Joel. Uh, ushers, can you come forward? We're going to go into our time of giving. Let's pray. We thank you for this message this morning, Lord. I pray that our, our attitude and our position towards you will be improved by this message, Lord, and that we can determine what is right worship for you. Um, this is a powerful message in that regard, Lord. I just pray that we would that all be introspective as to what is worship and how should we be worshiping you. And Lord, we know that part of the worship to you is the, the giving of, of tithes and, and offerings. And we just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can do that. Please bless the gift of the givers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. one time on the Ten Commandments that I thought was very helpful for me and I thought I'd like to share with you guys and um, hope it'll hopefully be helpful for you as well. Uh, the pastor was in, uh, saying that the Israelites were crying out to God for salvation, right? And the bondage. And so God came, sent uh, Moses. Um, there was a blood sacrifice, uh, the Passover, and God took them out of Egypt. He walks them through the Red Sea. There's a baptism there, right? Um, and then after all of this is when he gave the Ten Commandments. He didn't come in and say, when they called out for him, he says, here, get your life straightened out, these, follow these commandments, and then I'll pull you out. And that's not the way the Ten Commandments work. God laid down all the work for us to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. The Ten Commandments then allow us to be sanctified, to make ourselves holy, to make ourselves more Christ-like. That's the roadmap for us to do that. And so this last song we're singing is the goodness of God. And we can praise God and worship Him for everything that He did for us that can bring us into His presence and to guide us to being sanctified. Let's sing. Oh 